All right, so we're kind of moving from the basic ST1 orchestrator, which is the uh, automation of overlay tunnels, routes, and so on, into public clouds now. Because this is kind of a common topic when we work with customers. Most of them that we talk to, like Kishore mentioned, they say they have the NDC project, and they want to pick a vendor that simplifies the overall on-ramp into public clouds. It could be any of the public cloud vendors. So we'll go through what exactly we do for simplifying the lives in public cloud when it comes to SD-WAN. And it, first thing first, what exactly do we have for public cloud? It is a virtual gateway offering. It is uh, highly scalable. We have different SKUs available. For smaller uh, facilities, we have the 500 MB SKUs. It goes up to 2 gig, 4 gig. One of the prime reasons when customers talk to us, they pick these virtual gateways over the natively available uh, VPN gateways in public cloud is because of scale. They have tens of thousands of routes they want to advertise, and they want to build tens of thousands of tunnels. And some of the uh, native services are really low scale when it comes to number of IPsec associations you could make. So we solved that problem at first. The other thing is kind of natively extending your SD-WAN fabric into the public cloud. When customers have combinations of circuits, many of them, they actually have a private MPLS going into their head end, or it could be a co-location facility. From there on, they have an express route or a direct connect. And they also have a local broadband circuit. And they have different types of traffic profiles. Some have uh, production traffic, some have just dev test and QA traffic. And they want to really differentiate between production grade traffic and uh, regular traffic, best effort traffic. And they want to leverage SD-WAN policies. So what we really do is, just like what we talked about in terms of orchestration, we understand the private connection, public connections, build different types of tunnels back into public cloud, all in an automated way. So you can leverage your application queues and all the uh, application-oriented policies are user-based policies. In some cases, they say, this is my uh, QA cluster in the cloud, but this is my production cluster in the cloud. But my developers are writing code in public cloud, and based on the user profile, we're not talking DPI and applications anymore. That's, of course, possible on the branch gateway. We can also leverage the user profile to figure out this user belongs to development, this user belongs to QA, and I, when I route their traffic into public cloud, I'm going to put them on a different path put them on different SLA profile, different QoS profile. All that is possible when we extend the SD-WAN fabric into public cloud. So this is just about uh, putting VMs out there in marketplace and say, hey, customer, here are the VMs. Why don't you manage? No, it goes a lot more than that. First things first, how do we onboard those nodes into our fabric? Because that doesn't come with a TPM chip. All of our devices come with TPM chip. So we automate the entire process. As soon as the VM boots up, uh, we have an orchestrator just built for that. The, it also gives a one-time password. So it requests the Aruba service, certificate service to say, here is uh, the EST process. Why don't you give me a certificate? So when the VM fully boots up, when it talks to Central, we can identify that this is an Aruba provided entity. This is not a random VM that's trying to talk to us. Um, so that is the ZTP and licensing part. The second is high availability. If you really think of different models we have in public cloud, you have single AZ, multi AZ, and most customers do want to bring up a couple of virtual gateways, not a single virtual gateway. And how do you handle all the failover? In some cases, all of our tunnels fail over from one virtual gateway to other. But if you really think of the northbound, northbound it's a bunch of subnets. There is no native routing protocol within a VPC or a VNet. So you've got to go to each subnet and say, now all of my routes need to point to the backup virtual gateway. So we automate all of that as well. <clears throat> Our virtual gateway orchestrator keeps an eye on the health of the VM itself, keeps on, uh, an eye on the health of the orchestrated service, all the tunnels, routes. As soon as we figure out there is a problem on the first one, we move all of the tunnels and routes to the backup. We, using their API gateway, we actually talk to the public cloud subnets and say, now it's time to fail out to the backup. We always ensure that there is symmetry, there is no black hole of traffic whatsoever. So for that use case in yeah. AWS, you guys do all the work. You only have to interface. You recommend everyone goes with Transit Gateway, I'm assuming, so you don't have to deal with. Correct. Hold the thought on Transit Gateway. We have a section on what are the recommended best practices for building topologies for public cloud. And then yeah. same for, for Google on shared, shared VPC. Absolutely. Okay. It is Transit Gateway, Transit VNet, or shared VPC. It's the same model that we are seeing more and more customers doing because it's not a single VPC or VNet anymore. In every region, they have a bunch of VPCs. Mm -hmm. So we integrate with Transit Gateway. We integrate with vHub of um, Microsoft Azure, we're working with GCP as well. So it's all integrated. We'll talk about, we show a demo of that. Okay. Yeah. So why don't you look at it directly? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So we're back to our uh, landing page. We have our sites in Europe. We have our sites in, in North America. And, um, as we mentioned, two of the sites are cloud data centers, okay? Our, uh, this one is Azure, this one is AWS. 
and we're going to start uh, like bringing up sites in the Asia Pac region. Okay, and the first thing I'm going to do, I don't have a data center there yet. I'm going to spin up uh, a virtual gateway in my in my AWS region. How do I do that? How does Central help me uh, take care of that? Okay, so we can come here to network services. We can come here to our um, uh, virtual gateways. We see the ones that are already created. Let's go to the gear, and we see how um, in in my in my Aero Central account, I've already entered the the credentials for. Azure as well as for AWS. And uh, entering the, the credentials, this is a token that allows me to talk to the API. Okay? And uh, like we can add an account as easily as creating the, this is a, an administrative name, it's just for me to, to follow. This, the ARN token uh, or the ARN, it's, it's not well seen because it just gets the cut of the screen. But uh, what we have there is that this one token that can only be used if the API is triggered from this account ID that represents Urbis Central with this external ID that, this, that represents this particular Urbis Central tenant. Now, okay? Do you guys so, put the IAM rule components in there automatically as part of the, can, so you restrict it down to only being able to do transit gateway for these services? Yeah, absolutely. So we follow the best practices of what level of credential access we need. So when we create this IAM rule, we can automate in terms of what we really need. If it's a single VPC deployment, we don't even need permissions to do a transit gateway. It's multi-VPC. You guys ask for API access first, or you just provide a cloud, cloud formation template that people just pre-apply? We don't have cloud formation template today. Okay. So we try to orchestrate everything within this. That way it calls into API gateway and puts a permission there. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I already have added my, my account. That gives me visibility <coughs> into my deployment. Okay, and this is, when I go into deployment, this is the orchestrated mode that Manny was, was referring to. Once again, I can see my Azure environment. I can see how I have uh, a virtual gateway already deployed. This is the one I have in, in the West Coast. I have a couple more uh, VNets that I'm not using yet, or I don't have yet in my, in my SD-WAN. The first thing it does is kind of it discovers the topology. The basic problem, even before you start deploying virtual gateways is, as network engineers, you're pulled into projects and say, now I need cloud connectivity. You need to understand where your workloads are running, in what regions, how many VPCs are there, how many VNets are there. Once you have the right level of credential, as per the best practice, you can simply say, discover my cloud topology. It nicely lays out in terms of how many regions you have, and you can click on every region. It shows here are the VPCs. What subnets are you running in each VPC, and which one you need to connect. So it kind of puts this nice topology view of your cloud. Yes. So once you're here, the, um, we have visibility uh, about what is in our cloud environment. We haven't logged into uh, AWS or Azure yet. Well, we did log in to fetch that token that we posted here. That's all we did. Um, now we're going to bring up a, a virtual GUI. And it's, it's telling us what it needs. And um, once again, we have the, 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 the line here. But it's telling us, I'm going to use a subnet for my own use. I'm going to. What gateway size do you want? We start, have the small one, 500 meg, 2 gig, 4 gig. What uh, instance type? Uh, of course, the bigger ones will be able to support more performance. What uh, image do you want me to, to deploy? You may have uh, different images, uh, different uh, robotized versions. The only thing we really have to enter is the SSH key in case you need a backdoor into a device and the firewall policy that you are going to apply to this VM. And here is where you select high availability, and if you want high availability in multiple availability zones or not. Mm -hmm. Just for the purpose of this demo one, because we're just starting in, in APAC, I'm just going to hit it uh, like for a single node because it's a little bit quicker. This, what it starts doing, it um, creates all the network interfaces, creates a different subnets that I have to interconnect to the LAN, to the, my, my direct connect or my express route in, in Azure, my internet gateway, and um, once it has all those uh, subnets connected, it brings up the VM. The VM comes up, and it'll take, it's, I think it's around 45 seconds or so in the case of, of AWS. Once it comes up, it'll talk to our, our certificate authority using that one-time uh, password that Manny referred to. It'll do an, an EST request to, to fetch its certificate. From then on, it'll be able to talk to Central as any other device. It'll behave as any other uh, VPN concentrator or head and gateway. <laughs> It'll talk to the SD1 orchestrator. Talk to um, like all, all our all our other uh, devices. It'll be managed entirely from Aruba Central. So, question about that process you just described: Is that uh, starts the orchestration for a virtual TPM? 
That's not a virtual. So, TPM is is a hardware is a hardware chipset or is a hardware platform that is installed in our in our gateways. So you can't do. It's not really a TPM for for a, a virtual machine. What we have is we request a certificate that's unique for that device, that's signed by the OSCA, that identifies uniquely that device. When that device reaches to Central, Central knows, ha, huh, this is the virtual gateway from this tenant, I'll put it here. And from then on, you configure it as you want. It solves the same use case as what TPM was doing for a hardware device, but it's not entirely a virtual TPM, it's a, a vendor-provided certificate based on authentication. Yeah, they injected a runtime for the for the exactly, it's injected as runtime. Yeah. So, um, yeah. out of curiosity for this, the NACL security group permissions, do you build those dynamically as, so as data is coming down from central, right, you're then getting the population for the public addresses that are supposed to be pairing into the hub. Do you then dynamically build all of the security groups and NACL permissions around Transit Gateway in the hub, or do you, how do you, how do you handle that to make sure that you're just not getting randoms that are trying to do like DDoS protections and things like that? Yeah, today it's not automated. Today what we discover what has been built. So if you go to a VPC and then it already has um, the security group access list attached, that right. way you, let's say you have a cloud formation template that does it automatically. Mm -hmm. We just discover this and attach to this virtual mission as well. So we are not dynamically building security group access list. Right. So, you, so you guys are, typically you want to build a net new, a, some sort of net new VPC for this service because if I'm auto provisioning for workloads that are running in the same cloud section and I'm running different SGs and NACLs, I'm going to have a conflict, right? Um, no, hold that thought. There's two deployment. There's two deployment models, and we're going to go into that right now. But um, you see here that it says disconnected. It says disconnected because the device is still down. Okay, and there's a set of subnets here. This is an existing VPC where I have my uh, workloads. When this guy, it just was orchestrated, the VM has to power up. Once the VM powers up, this guy, the, we will have a little square here that will give us the option to connect this subnet to the virtual gateway. When you click on connect, what it does, it tells that subnet, it goes to AWS, tells that subnet, hey, egress, or your exit point is now this virtual gateway. So in the case of the route tables. Route tables. Yes, it modifies the route tables. It doesn't attach modify to the your subnet. SGs or, or NACLs. So the, so the problem, the <laughs> route tables are one set of permissions. SGs and NACLs are another, one's a white. It does not right. modify SGs and NACLs. We, as part of the orchestra, we, we select, we, we, have a, 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 we have visibility over whatever you have configured in, in AWS, and we just uh, pick whatever we yeah, want. Yeah, the other use. way to put it is we are not creating, or creating any type of conflicts with what you have configured. Right. We are just choosing so what also, is there. You're not also doing permissions, so, exactly. so, you have, so that's why you have to go through the transit gateway side. That's why you want to do a different VPC. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Gateway, more and more it's becoming where there's a dedicated VPC for network services, and we have full access to that, and we can manage the entire thing, including the security group access list. Right. That model is becoming more prevalent, but if it's a single VPC for whatever reason, we are not creating any conflicts with the existing security group access list. We just show what is there, and you can apply that. And you're doing the same thing for route configurations for Direct Connect, I'm assuming. So Absolutely. for Direct Connect, yes. you can do the BGP route injects and then do the community strings to be able to validate. Exactly. That's right. the same thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I think the best, move, the way, best way to address your questions is to move on to the next, uh, the next part of this block where we talk about the deployment models. What I was showing there, what I had uh, in... Sydney, I had a single VPC, is equivalent to what you see here. I have a set of subnets, and when I click connect, I basically tell them this is their egress point and this is their... I don't tell them this, this is their backup egress point. I know it, okay? If this guy dies or if the tunnels, we, it starts losing tunnels or routes, the orchestra will flip all these uh, routes or, or these uh, routes that are applied to subnets. I know it's a kind of strange concept, but that's how cloud providers work, to the, to the other one. Okay, that is single VPC environment. Now we come to a customer that has uh, a little more time, has spent a little more time on, on their cloud provider. They have a broader uh, set of, of services in their cloud provider. They probably have multiple VPCs or multiple VNets. What we do there is we use, we still orchestrate the virtual gateways, but in this case, what we're gonna do is we set up a BGP connectivity to the, the VWAN or to the transit gateway, and we exchange routes from our SD-WAN into the cloud environment. Does that make sense? Yep. So I've got one question on the AWS side. So, you know, for years we've been talking about clear pass in AWS and just the amount of 
traffic and everything else going back and forth and the bills just go skyrocketing. So how do you fix that with this stuff? Well, there's the, a lot of threads, it's a lot of yes. a lot of stuff going on. So you're you're putting it in AWS, but you know what the price point's got to be crazy to do that, I would So think. I have uh, a couple of vir uh, virtual gateways running in my in my AWS account. It is roughly around $200, and I have zero discount. I have like the, the right. just a lab account. It's roughly around uh, a couple hundred dollars per virtual gateway per month. Wow. That is uh, the, the cost of the VM. What we are trying to do is we are trying to adjust the, the, the requirements of the VM as much as we can. But uh, to a certain extent, yeah. uh, I, just, it's I mean, I just remember what it was with ClearPass, and it was yeah. just because of, you know, obviously what's going on. It's different animals, yeah. but it's still a and lot. And you could right size it as well. That's why we create multiple SKUs. Yes. Some customers, they only have 100 sites. They right. say, I have a 500 meg circuit. I don't want anything more than that. So you could right size your VM. You're not paying extra for your cloud provider. You have 2 gig, 4 gig. We're working on a higher gig model as well. So one is that. The other model is also the software pricing that goes for Virtual Gateway itself. It actually covers everything, including the orchestrator. It covers the SD-WAN services. It covers the uh, price of the software as well. We are, if you compare that to the number of VPN connections you're building with the native service of a cloud provider right. versus this, which is tens of thousands, it just pays for itself. Way more than that. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you can do reserved instances up for those types. You could do reserved instances. That's correct. So I mean, how much data is actually getting passed back to that gateway, I guess, as part of the deal? I mean, how much are you, like on yours, how much are you seeing? I'm not seeing a lot of data because mine is just a lab environment. It really depends on what you have on your on your environment, on your what, how many workloads you have running there. But if you have those workloads running there, your data is going to go through the, right. is going to go to them anyway. Yeah. So when you pay for network usage, that's independent of whether it's going through the SD one or or whether it's going through the just the internet or whatever. No, I mean I'm the VM itself. It's, just, it's the virtual versus the VM argument, yeah. right? The VM itself, what it gives us is uh, a lot of there, what it gives us is a lot of tunnels, a lot of uh, crypto performance for packed in, in a relatively small VM, relatively inexpensive uh, AMI uh, in, in, in AWS lingo. Right. 